doesn't like to have options. Kind of thought there might not be, but thought somebody might raise their hand just to, you know, raise their hand. That's an option. Do you always get the options? Do you always have the options that you want? You know, we always have options in life, right? We always have choices. We just don't always have the ones that we would like. You know, I have some options I'm wrestling with. I have a 95 car and an 03 car, both of them with well over 200,000 miles, getting close to 250,000. And, you know, at some point, something, you know, is going to have to change. Now, the options that I would like... <laughs> you seem to think that's funny? <laughs> well, that's one option. The other, I kind of like that one. You know, this nice electric car they've got that goes almost 300 miles on a charge... You know, it would be kind of nice to have my filling station right there in the garage. Just plug it in and, you know, get on the off-peak rates, the best thing. It would be nice. <laughs> well, there's another option, another concern. But again, you know, it would be nice. In fact, really the option I would like would be not to just have one, but to be able to buy both of them. How many of you think that someday the pastor is going to come driving to church in either one of those cars? <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that, you know. Optimism. Again, now the truth is, I probably do have an option of getting one of those cars. But there may be a little compromise involved. You know, the new car that I get, when that does happen, it may not be you know, brand new, right off the lot, never been driven by anybody else, you know, other than just kind of backed off the car, the train, whatever it is, however it's transported. May have to wait a little while for it. But, you know, I am thinking, you know, with that Corvette, with that Tesla, it might be possible in about mm, 10 to 15 years that I could buy one of those won't be quite as new as, you know, the nice shiny pictures that we put up there. But we have to compromise sometimes in life, sometimes in the choices we make. You know, now I want to be careful here, you know, and I want to ask you to raise your hand. But how many of you have ever compromised in marriage? The real truth is it ought to be pretty safe because if you haven't ever compromised in your marriage, you've probably got real issues and you may not even be married anymore. You know, there are some compromises that just have to come. Now, you know, my wife, she had to make a minor compromise. She was kind of hoping for somebody like George Clooney, and she ended up with me. Just a small compromise, right? I mean, not much difference. Pretty close. But, you know, we make them in life. In every area of life, we sometimes make compromises. Is it right? Is it wrong to make a compromise, or does it depend on what it is that we're compromising on? Is it a moral issue? Now, you know, the real truth is we don't even agree on that. Some things that we compromise on, one person may be convinced it's a moral issue, and somebody else may be convinced it's not a moral issue. The standard is this book. It's not the pastor's opinion. It's not church doctrine. I believe with the doctrines and the teachings of our church. But you know, it's not truth because the church teaches it. It's not truth. It's not a moral issue because the pastor thinks so. And it's not a moral issue because you think so. God is the standard. His word. And I need to be very careful when I start compromising there. There are a lot of places in life where not only can I, but I should be willing to compromise. But when it comes to truth, I must be very careful. Why do we compromise? I suppose a lot of reasons. Maybe it's simply, you know, to keep peace. In a marriage, often if there are no compromises, it's going to be problematic. There's not going to be a whole lot of peace and happiness, right? That's something that just kind of comes with it sometimes. Now, it's always bad if one spouse is doing the majority of the compromising. It's probably not a healthy relationship. 
to make decisions. Sometimes, you know, the only way we can make decisions is both sides have to give, and neither gets exactly what they want. At the risk of getting into a dangerous area, you know, I wish that some of our politicians would learn a little better how to compromise. And at the risk of, like I say, getting in trouble, I don't think either side has it all figured out perfectly. I think somewhere in the middle, we'd probably be a little better off, just my own personal opinion. You may or may not agree with it, but often we need decisions. You know, we're hearing this about coming up at the end of September, about some issues, whether or not they're going to continue with funds if one side doesn't get their way. And, well, anyway, I don't want to get into all that. If you want to read about it, you can find it. If you don't, that's okay. But sometimes, in order to make decisions, we have to do it. Sometimes we make compromises to be safe. You know, I have to make some changes in order for my own protection. But I wonder... Do we ever make compromises because we lack faith? Is that ever a reason that we compromise? It would be nice to say that it's not, but I'm guessing that on some occasions it has been a problem in your life. David, you remember the story we've been looking at. We've been moving along here. 1 Samuel chapter 27, starting with verse 1. And David said in his heart, Now I shall perish someday by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than that I should speedily escape to the land of the Philistines, and Saul will despair of me to seek me any more in any part of Israel. So shall I escape out of his hand." Then David arose and went over with 600 men who were with him to Achish, the son of Moak, king of Gath. So David dwelt with Achish at Gath, he and his men, each with his household, and David with his two wives, Ahinam the Jezreelite, and Abigail the Camelitess, Nabal's widow. And David was told that Saul had... And Saul was told that David had fled to Gath, so he sought him no more. Does David compromise? How many would say yes? How many would say no? Just how many would say yes? How many say no? How many don't want to say anything? <laughs> Is David protecting himself and his family? That's his goal. You know, I'm not safe in Israel. It's not safe here. Saul is trying. If I go to the land of the Philistines, I'll be safe there. Is it wrong for me to want to protect my family, my loved ones, to be in a place where I am safe? Is there anything wrong with that? No, I don't think there's anything wrong with what David is desiring, what he wants. However, there are some problems. Does it work? Saul was told what? David has fled to the Philistines. He sought him no more. So it must be okay, right? I mean, if it works, it's okay, right? I mean, that's the test of whether something's right or wrong is whether or not it works, right? It is often for us, isn't it? Well, if it works, it must be of God. It must be that God is blessing, and that's why it worked. Folks, I'm thankful God blesses me when I do some things that I have no business doing. Because if God didn't bless me when I was doing things I shouldn't be doing, I'd be dead and so would you. I'm thankful that God blesses us and God protects us in spite of the fact that we do and we go places that we shouldn't ever be. You know, if you wonder, ask Moses about it. You remember Moses, his story. Moses had struck the rock the first time God had told him to. And then the second time, he strikes the rock again. Does it work? It worked, didn't it? Water came out of the rock just like it was supposed to. Was it right? No. He had disobeyed God. Did it cost Moses? Absolutely. Every time I compromise, every time I do things my way instead of God's way, it will cost me. I may not see it at the time. I may not recognize it until way down the road. I may not even fully understand it until the other side of eternity. But every time we compromise, it costs us. 
when we compromise, there is always a cost. There is always a price to pay. We may not see it at the time. It may seem like, well, it's just a little thing. I mean, it really doesn't matter that much. I mean, you know, I'm not making big compromises. They're just little compromises. Probably seemed like a pretty little thing to Eve, didn't it? I mean, I just want to go look at the tree. I just want to look at the fruit. I mean, I want to see and know, why is this fruit any different than any other? I wonder how often we just put ourselves a little bit on the devil's ground and we're surprised when things turn out poorly. Do we make compromises in our lives? I remember a story a long time ago I heard before the days of the Internet, so it was probably true back then. Actually, I don't know if it was true or a story or not. But nonetheless, it was about the boy who had a pet python. You know, it started out as a little snake. But, you know, they tend to grow and grow and grow and grow. And he had this little game that he would play with the snake. He had wrapped the snake around its, his waist, and the snake would begin to constrict. Well, you know, a small snake, no problem. You can take care of that. But, you know, the snake began to grow. And his friends would tell him, you know, this is not a good, oh, we're just playing a game. But, of course, the snake didn't know it was just a game. And there came that day when the snake got strong enough that he couldn't free himself. And before help could be found, before anything could be done, he was dead. I wonder, as Christians, are we playing with a serpent? That serpent called the devil and Satan. My friends, if you are playing with a serpent, it will always cost you. The devil is not playing a game. He's playing for eternity. Oh, he'll tell you it's a game. He'll tell you it's okay. It won't cost you anything. It won't hurt you. But he's been a liar from the very beginning. He told Eve, oh, you're not going to die. You can eat this fruit. It'll make you wise. Sadly, we are often still buying the same lies. Are we compromising? Are we compromising with the Philistines? Are we compromising with the world? Well, pastor, you don't understand. I need a safe place. You know, I really need a place where I'm safe, where I can be comfortable, where I can be happy, where... And we have all our reasons... I hate to ask the question, is the world ever safer than the church? It's kind of a trick question, but it's kind of not. I mean, the church ought to be a safe place when I'm hurting, when I'm going through a difficult time. I ought to be able to come to my church family and tell them anything and know that I will be loved and I will be accepted and I will be protected. And I will be shown the grace of God. But I'm guessing there are some here that have found it's not always that way in the church. In fact, if we're really honest, sometimes out there in the world, they're a lot more accepting than we are in the church. They're a lot more compassionate. They're a lot more forgiving. But there is always a danger Maybe the real question is not the world or the church. The real question is, is there, is the world ever safer than Jesus? Now, there may be days I feel that way. David felt that way. David's at that point. You know, I've got to do something and I'll be safer with the Philistines than I am in Israel. And the problem is he forgot his safety was not about where he was. It was about in whose hands he put his life, who he trusted with his safety. Do you trust Jesus? Are you putting everything in his hands? I like 
2 Corinthians 3.18, familiar passage, something we talk time to time. Paul puts it very simply, talking about in the context of Moses coming down from spending time on the mount, and he had to put the veil over his face because his face shone with the glory of God. But we all with unveiled faces beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being what? transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. I wonder, what is it that is transforming you? Is it the world? Is it the things of the world? Or is it Jesus? What are you beholding this morning? What are you beholding today? What do you behold on a day-to-day -day basis? What is it that you are reflecting in your life? What is it that other people see? <laughs> or don't see in our lives, in our relationships? Do they see a reflection of Jesus? You remember that very first verse. In the New International Version, it puts it a little different. But David thought to himself, one of these days I will be destroyed by the hand of Saul. The best thing I can do is to escape to the land of the Philistines. Then Saul will give up searching for me anywhere in Israel, and I will slip out of his hand. The best thing I can do. is to go to the land of the Philistines. It would be nice to say that temptation is not there today, but it's still there. David begins to compromise. He thinks to himself. He begins to talk to himself. He begins to tell himself, you know, I'm not safe here. And he was right. But my friends, when I start talking to myself instead of to God, I'm going to end up someplace I shouldn't be. The best thing I can do. You know, I like the idea. Certainly we should all be looking. What is the best thing I can do? What is the best option that I have? The best option. Is it the Philistines? Is that really David's best option? Now, we're not going to look at everything in the story that we could look at. But you know how the story goes. He does well. He goes out and he raids. And he's supposed to help the king fight against his own countrymen. He gets sent back. It's not a pretty sight. We're going to look a little bit at it. But it's not really the best option. But sometimes we think it's the world. You know, I'll be safe there. Folks, I understand the desire to have a safe place. And it saddens me that sometimes the church is not as safe a place as it should be. But I can assure you it's still better than out there in the world, ultimately. Because ultimately, the only thing the world has to offer is temporary. It's not permanent. They may give you some safety for a time, but ultimately, it's going to end poorly. Have you been there? Have you been in that experience where you felt like, you know, that's what I've got to do? You know, the fact is, we can identify with David. We can understand the best option for David, the best option for us is not to talk to ourselves, not to sit there and have this conversation with myself. It's to turn to God. It is to pray. It is to ask God, what is it that I should do? What is your plan for my life? What direction do you want me to go? Where do you want me to be? Are we asking God for direction? Do we trust God? That is always the best option, is to trust God fully and completely. And you know, intellectually, we know it up here. The problem is, when it comes to application, it's difficult at times to trust God fully and completely, to put everything in His hands. Compromise starts when I look to myself. When I trust myself, well, you know, the only person I can count on is me. My friends, if the best person you have to count on is you, I feel sorry for you. 
Because the bottom line is ultimately you will always let yourself down. You may not admit it. You may deny it. You may convince yourself otherwise. But there is only one person in the universe who will not let us down. And it's not me. It's not the pastor. It is Jesus. You see, when I take my eyes off of Jesus, I begin to compromise. It may be just little things. Well, you know, it really doesn't matter that much. It's not a big deal. Are you talking to yourself? Are you talking to Jesus? In the book Patriarchs and Prophets, it talks about David's struggle. David's conclusion that Saul would certainly accomplish his murderous purpose was formed without the counsel of God. Even while Saul was plotting and seeking to accomplish his destruction, the Lord was working to secure David the kingdom. God works out his plans. Though to human eyes they are veiled in mystery, men cannot understand the ways of God. And looking at appearances, they interpret the trials and tests and provings that God permits to come upon them as things that are against them and that will only work their ruin. Thus David looked on appearance and not at the promises of God. He doubted that he would ever come to the throne. Long trials had wearied his faith and exhausted his patience. My friends, I wish I could say that I can't ever relate to David. But I'm guessing I'm not the only one that has been at those points when you've gotten tired, you've gotten weary, you've gotten discouraged. And you've lost sight of Jesus and his promise. The best option, the best thing I can do for myself is to look to Jesus. The one who gave his life. The one who was willing to leave heaven. You want to talk about a compromise. Now in most contexts, I want to be very clear, God does not compromise. But I don't know any other term for it. To leave heaven and come to planet earth, if that's not a compromise to leave the worship, the adoration of angels and all the angelic hosts and come and be born in a babe, to be misunderstood, to be rejected, to give up all that for you and for me. Did you talk to Jesus today, this morning? Did you thank Him for what He does for you each and every day? Do you take time to reflect and to remember and to think about all that God does for us each and every day? Did you take time to study His Word, to read it, to meditate on it, to think about what Jesus has done and what Jesus has planned and prepared for you? You see, the only thing that I know that will safely protect me from compromise is a personal, intimate relationship with Jesus. Are you compromising? Now the pastor start, stopped preaching and started meddling again, hadn't he? You know, we've all been tempted, haven't we? You know, I talked about that new car the pastor would like. And you know, if I look at what I turn into the church every month, you know, that would make a pretty nice car payment. But the compromise or the problem is when I see that as my money instead of God's. You know, if it's my money and I'm giving this much of my money to God and, you know, I could use it here and I really need it, it makes sense, doesn't it? The problem is how much of it is my money? None. You know, and it puts it in a total different perspective when I accept the fact that it's all God's. And God simply asked me to give back a small percentage of His money to Him. And He says the rest of it, basically, you know, there's some principles, but you can do whatever you want with it. All I ask is you return 10% plus give some offerings. I'll leave that up to your discretion. Well, Pastor, that's not my problem. I give tithe. Now, you know, I don't give it to the church because there's some other... Excuse me? What does the Bible say? Return all the tithes to wherever you think it will be used best. Return all the tithes to the storehouse. But pastor, you don't understand some of the problems in the storehouse. Yeah, actually I do. I probably understand some of them better than you because I've been working for the storehouse for a long time. 
I grew up with my parents working. I know some of the, I know some that you don't know. But you know what? That's not the issue. God didn't say, return your tithes to the storehouse if the storehouse is using it the right way. Folks, and I'm going to really step on some toes here. Maybe, I hope not. But you know what? If there's any organization you're supporting that is willing to accept your tithe dollar, it's not an organization you ought to have anything to do with. Because if they're willing to compromise and say, yeah, we'll take your tithe, they're compromising and they're teaching you to compromise. And I know there are some of them out there. Now, wherever you want to send your offering, that's between you and God. But God's been very clear where my tithe is to go. Well, maybe I'll meddle a little more. We could talk about the Sabbath. God says, remember the Sabbath morning to keep it holy. Not what he says? Remember the Sabbath day. Well, you know, I keep most of it, but occasionally there are some things I really need to do, and I need to take care of some of my stuff. But folks, let's really be honest. Is the issue the fact that I don't keep the Sabbath holy for 24 hours? Is that the problem? If I'm just more careful about keeping the 24 hours, that will solve the problem of compromise in my life. You see, folks, the real issue is not how I keep the Sabbath. The real issue is do you know the Lord of the Sabbath? And are you in love with the Lord of the Sabbath? Because you see, if I'm really in love with the one whose day it is, then the truth is 24 hours is not long enough to spend with him. You know, I'm eager for the Sabbath to stop, and I'm sad when it's over. Now, I want to ask you, I've said it before, I want to ask you to raise your hands. But you know, are you happier when the Sabbath begins or when the Sabbath ends? The problem is not with my Sabbath observance. The problem is with my relationship with Jesus. Because if I love Jesus more than anything else, 24 hours is not enough. But if 24 hours seems like a long time, then what you need to do is work on your relationship with Jesus. We could talk about the commandments. You know, Adventists, we make a point. We are the church that keeps, keeps all the commandments of God. But I wonder, do you love God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul? Do you love others? Do you love your neighbor as yourself? Are those two principles what motivates everything you do? Just one of them here. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Now, I'm sure most of us would raise our hand and say, no, I don't bear false witness against my neighbor. The ninth commandment, I keep that. Have you ever compromised it? No, I don't think that's one. You know, there's some things that I, but I don't think that's one of them. Do you bear false witness? Is everything you say true? Everything. Well, you know, I'm pretty sure it's true. So I'm going to tell you what I think. Let's see, if I'm pretty sure it's true, am I bearing false witness? If it's not totally true, do we ever gossip? Well, I heard. I even heard it from a really good source. I mean, somebody that I know and I trust. Do you know for sure it's true? Do we repeat rumors? You know, we had for our pastor's meeting just this week, a fellow by the name of Jose Rojas. You may know who he is, you may not. Worked for the North American Division, the General Conference, etc. He was telling a story about the day that he died. 
He left the office a little early that morning and, or that day, and somebody came in a little after he had left, and they said, there's been an accident right out here, and Jose Rojas is dead. He was killed. Now, you know, as best he could figure, they must have had, you know, that handlebar mustache that he has and been kind of short and Mexican, and, and they were sure that... And they came, and they started spreading, and everybody's thinking, what are we going to do? How are we going to... How are we going to tell? And it went around... And finally, there was one gentleman who decided, you know, maybe I'll just call and check with the family and see what's going on. And, of course, he dialed Jose's cell phone number, and Jose answered. And he said, who is this? This is Jose Rojas. Are you sure this is who, you know, and they kind of a little bit back and forth. And he said, well, I needed to talk to you because I heard you were dead. And I heard it from a source I really trust. The source that he really trusted was the general conference president. Now, folks, I'm not here to put anybody down. That's not my purpose. But, you know, sometimes there are sources we really trust, and they mean well, and they're genuine and sincere, but they still don't have all the information. We need to be careful that we're not bearing false witness. Well, I read it on the Internet. Boy, no more reliable source than that, is there? Well, but you know, somebody, you know, at the beginning of the letter, it was somebody that was really important that they got it from. Well, we could probably look at all the commandments. Maybe one is enough. But you know what, folks? Even if it's true, it doesn't mean I have to say it. You know, Jesus said, there are many things I could tell you, but you can't bear it. He also said to do unto others as what? You would have them do to you. Are the stories you're telling, even if they're true, things that you would want told about you? And if they're not, then can I be blunt and say, shut up? I'm sorry, that's not typical church language. But you know what? Even if it's true, if it's not grace-oriented, if it's not redemptive, then I'm not keeping the commandments. Because the commandments are about loving others as Christ loved me. And David and his men went up and raided the Gershites and the Gerzites and the Amalekites. For those nations were inhabitants of the land from of old. And as you go to Sir, even as far as the land of Egypt, David is raiding different places. And whenever ever David attacked the land, he left neither man nor woman alive, but took away the sheep, the oxen, the donkeys, the camels, and the apparel, and returned and came to Achish. Then Achish would say, where have you made a raid today? And David would say, against the southern area of Judah, or against the southern area of the Jeremiahites, or against the southern area of the Kenites. David would save neither man nor woman alive to bring news to Gath, saying, lest they should inform on us. Thus David did, and thus was his behavior all the time he dwelt in the country of the Philistines. So Achish believed David, saying, He has made his people Israel utterly abhor him. Therefore, he will be my servant forever. My friends, may I suggest that compromise always leads to more compromise. David is leading a double life. That commandment not to bear false witness. Every time he goes out, he's bearing false witness. Well, this is what I did. I wonder, are you living a double life? What does it cost you? What is it costing you? What will it cost you in your relationships with others and ultimately your relationship with God? David kind of jumping to the end of the story. After he's dismissed from going and fighting against Israel, he returns home. That happened when David and his men came to Ziglag, on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and attacked it and burned it with fire and had taken captive the women and those who were there from small to great, they did not kill anyone but carried them away and went their way. 
So David and his men came to the city. There it was, burned with fire, and their wives, their sons, and their daughters had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives, Ahinam the Jezreelitess and Abigail the widow of Nabal the Camelite, Carmelite, had been taken captive. Now David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Then David said to Abathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, please bring the ephod here to me. And Abathar brought the ephod to David. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for, I shall, for you shall surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. David's compromise. It has put others at risk. It has put David's family at risk. It's put his friends and their families at risk. It has put everything that they hold dear at risk. Compromise always cost us, and it not only cost us, it costs others. Now, it's interesting, in this story, David's compromise, everything is restored. But every compromise David makes, and every compromise we find people in Scripture make, it always doesn't turn out quite so well. But I am thankful, in spite of our compromises, in spite of our failures, God is still redemptive, and He still restores things that we lose. And ultimately, He is going to restore everything on planet Earth to as it was before it was compromised by sin. The best option for David, the best option for us is to turn to God. It is to trust God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind. Verse 6 that we read before. Now David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and daughters. But David what? strengthened himself in the Lord his God. You know, we find this up and down with David. It gives me hope and encouragement because if I'm really honest, sometimes my spiritual life goes up and down. There are times where I'm very trusting of God and I do what I ought to do, and then there are other times where I don't quite have the faith I ought to have. David should have never been in the land of the Philistines. But I'm thankful when the crisis comes, David strengthens himself, not in what can I do, but he turns to the Lord his God. And he is strengthened and he is encouraged. He asks God what to do, and God says, pursue them, and I will give you everything back. Are you tempted? Are you tempted to compromise? Are you tempted to give up? Are you tempted to trust the world and think, you know, I'm better off out there than in here? Are you tempted to take your eyes off of Jesus, to doubt what God has promised? The best option, the only option, the only safe place, my friends, is in the arms of Jesus. It is Christ. It is trusting in Jesus. It is hiding in Jesus. It is looking to Him who is the author and the finisher of our faith. We all need a safe place each and every day. Sometimes we don't even realize we need that safe place. But we need it. And the only truly safe place, my friends, is the rock of ages. It is Jesus. Do you know Jesus? Do you trust Him? Have you given your life to Him? Is Jesus your safe place? Would you like to make Him your safe place today? Would you like to invite Him into your heart, into your life? Would you like to trust Him with everything? Our gracious Father, how thankful we are that You were willing to leave the safety, the security of heaven to come and live on this earth to give your life, to die on the cross of Calvary, that we might truly have a safe place in Jesus. Father, I would ask if there is anyone that has not accepted that safety.
that has not accepted that grace, that has not accepted Jesus, that in the quiet of this moment, say, Lord, I want to accept you. I want to trust you. I want you to come into my heart and my life. And I want you to change me and make me like you. And Father, for each one of us that have made that decision, may we choose each and every day to hide in Jesus, to make him our place of safety, our place of security each and every day until we see him coming to take us to the place he has prepared for us. This is our prayer in his name. Amen.